with faith in this word. If you have a Bible, and I hope you do, or somebody else around you does that you can look on, let me invite you to open it with me to Genesis chapter 22. It's the first book in the Bible, chapter 22. And then let me also invite you to open or pull out the worship guide that hopefully you received when you came in. And in that worship guide, there are some notes that will guide our time in the Word this morning. I want us to do something a little different during this time in the Word. So, so part of our purpose in reading through the Bible together, and just in case you're visiting with us or um, remember and have missed out the last couple of weeks, we're walking through a journey over the next two years where we're reading a couple chapters a day, and over the next two years we'll be through the Old Testament once, New Testament and Psalms twice, and you can find that Bible reading plan online. You can pick it up uh, at a bookstore or welcome desk when you leave too, but it's online at brookhills.org. Um, but as we're reading through the Bible together, part of our purpose is to help one another know how to read the Bible, how to study the Bible, how to experience all that God has designed for us in the Bible on a daily basis basis. So at the beginning of this year, we gave out a, a simple guide to personal worship that, again, you can download online as well from the church website, but developed to help, help you think through, okay, when I sit down with the Bible before God alone, well, what do I do? Where do I, where do I start? And I mentioned when I gave that out that we would be unpacking that guide at different points in the coming weeks. And a couple of weeks ago, we thought together specifically about our time in prayer. We looked at that acrostic pray, P-R-A-Y, and praise and repent and ask and yield. And we thought together, well, what does it look like to pray, to spend time alone with God praying? Where do you start? What do you do? And so I want us to do a similar thing this morning with Bible reading, Bible study. This is one of those areas, much like prayer, where I think we just assume that everybody else knows how to do this. Everybody else knows what this looks like on a daily basis, when the reality is many of us don't know how to do this. We don't know how to read, how to study the Bible, and as a result, we don't do this on a daily basis. Or, or we do it, maybe. We read. We've got the sense that we're not really experiencing all that God's designed for us, the delight that God's prepared for us in it. So what I want us to do this morning is I want us to read through a chapter of the Bible together, and we're going to do some audience participation, much like we've done in, in previous weeks, so no spectators here. We're going to work through some things, and even if you're not a Christian, we are glad you're here, uh, whether you're here to appease a friend or family member who keeps inviting you, or maybe you're just on uh, a journey in your life, in your spiritual life, where you're exploring Christianity. We invite you to study the Bible with us this morning. Even, even if you don't necessarily believe the Bible is God's Word, you would at least have to admit that this is one of the most timeless books in all of history, if not the most timeless book in all of history. So it, it'll be valuable just to Okay, what, what does it teach? What is it saying? So we're going to dive into the Word this morning. And what we're going to do is we're going to take, in that simple guide to personal worship, there was an acrostic there for Bible study called REAP, Read, Examine, Apply, and Pray. And you look at the notes that are in your worship guide, you'll see that acrostic here. Read, Examine, Apply, and Pray. So we're going to take Genesis chapter 22, and I want you this morning to get Maybe a taste of what reading and studying the Bible might look like on a daily basis in your life. Now, in order to do this together, we've got to put aside all the reasons that people give why we don't study the Bible. So some people, even Christians, say, well, I'm not a pastor. I mean, isn't, isn't that what your job is to do, David? Which is a part of my job. If I'm going to preach God's Word to you on a weekly basis, then I need to know what God's Word says but the beauty of the Bible is that it's accessible not just to the theologically trained pastor. It's accessible to every man, woman, boy, and girl who has a relationship with God. This was part of the magnificence of the Reformation centuries ago, really going back before then. So a little history aside that I think is, is worth it. We are indebted in this room. Obviously, God, author of Scripture, has given us this book. But then around 400 A.D., a guy named Jerome 
translated the Bible into Latin, what was called the Vulgate. And then, the reason I share that is because centuries after that, a guy named John Wycliffe came along, was the first to translate the Bible into English. He took Jerome's Latin version and translated it word for word into English, was accused of being a heretic for wanting to take the Bible and make it available in the language of ordinary people, not just ordained clergy. And even those who received this translation of the Bible would, be, would experience persecution for reading it. So Wycliffe was persecuted. Those who were reading the Bible were persecuted. Then along came William Tyndale. Tyndale followed in Wycliffe's footsteps about 200 years later with the first English New Testament based on the Greek instead of the Latin. He attempted to complete the Old Testament, but in 1536, Tyndale was executed and his body was burned all because of his commitment to make the Bible as accessible as possible to as many people as possible. In his words, he wanted to make the boy that drives, that drives the plow in England know more of Scripture than any scholar. Tyndale's associate, John Rogers, completed Tyndale's work in the next two years, and Rogers was mur martyred as well. So I want us to realize that even translation we have in our hands is the fruit of men and women in the past who have literally given their lives that the Bible might be accessible. In a way, this drives us even more when we think about people groups for which there is no translated scripture in their language to work toward that. But the Bible is, is available to us in such a way that the Bible is not designed for study by pastors only. Other people say, well, I just don't have time to study the Bible. I work a however many hour work week. I've got the kids all day long. I can't find 10 minutes to myself. And even if I did have 10 minutes, I would have no energy in it. And I'm guessing that we can all in some way identify with that in this room. We are a, a busy people. And that's, that's valid, but it leads us to the realization in order for a Bible study to be a reality in our lives, Bible study must be a priority in our lives. And that's really the question. What place or priority is reading and studying the Word of God going to have in your life? Because it will be, it will be easily drowned out by all kinds of things in your life, my life, in the world around us. I want to urge you today to make it a priority. And not to prioritize it because you have to, because you want to. So part of my goal this morning is to help you see the treasure that's just waiting to be discovered in this world so you'll want it. I want you to taste a little bit this morning in a way that you'll want a little bit more. And once you taste more, you'll want more and more. People ask me sometimes, well, how do I grow in my hunger, my desire for God's Word? And I think it's clear the way to grow in your hunger and your desire for God's Word is to read the Word. I've illustrated it before. When I first went over, the first time I went over to Heather's house, my wife, when, when I was just getting to know her and I was invited over to her house to have dinner with her family, and I get there and they serve seafood. Heather's family loves seafood. I grew up in a family where we, we never ate seafood. My dad hated seafood, so I just I didn't like seafood either. And so, so they serve seafood and they're like, uh, well, David, you, you like seafood? And I was like, ah, I want to impress this girl, and I want to say, I can't stand what you're putting in front of me to her parents. And so I say, oh, yeah, sure. And so I, I, I start eating the seafood, and, uh, and, and it didn't taste good, but I was thinking, well, I need to, well, this is, this is great, interesting, yeah, that and this. And, and so I started acting like I liked it. Well, the problem was they bought it. And so Subsequent visits over to her house were like, well, David loves seafood. Let's have sea seafood night. David's coming over. And it's like, oh, yes, of course. I'd start going on vacation with him down to the beach. And be like, oh, David, what's your favorite seafood restaurant on the beach? And like, ah, they're all great seafood restaurants. Like, inside of thing, is there a burger somewhere? And, and so I just eat seafood with Heather's family all the time to the point where now I, I love seafood. I eat seafood all the time now, by choice. It's, now, I'm not saying, okay, this is like miserable food that you got to learn to acquire taste, but what I'm saying, once you taste a little bit, it'll begin to change your appetite. 
and begin to change your appetite. Don't be surprised if you don't have a hunger for God's word when you fill your mind with internet, TV, movie, Twitter, whatever else, and you're just constantly filling your mind with that, and you're not filling your mind with the word, don't be surprised you don't have a hunger for God's word. You start filling your mind with God's word, and the appetite grows, and you begin to realize this is better than all of that other stuff put together. So you start to crave it, First Peter 2, 2, like newborn babies craving spiritual milk. So by it, you grow up in your salvation. I was putting our one-year-old to bed last night, and pull out a bottle, as soon as you pull out that before bed bottle, like it just, it goes into hyper overdrive, like give it to me, it's like he hasn't had anything all day long, and just grabs it and he sucks it down, drinks it down, just like that, and that's, that's, that's my prayer for us in the word. Yes, on a week by week basis when we gather in here, but for you and me to experience on a day by day basis. And in the process, realize Psalm 19 is true. This law of the Lord is perfect. It revives the soul. Testimony of the Lord is sure. It makes wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, rejoicing the heart. Commandment of the Lord is pure, enlightening the eyes. Rules of the Lord, they're true. They're righteous altogether. More to be desired are they than gold, even much fine gold. That you would love the word more than you love money. Sweeter also than honey and drippings of the honeycomb. You would love the word more than you love food. That it would be your daily bread. Moreover, by them is your servant warned in keeping this word. Word, there is great reward. So let's, let's uncover great reward. We're going to read Genesis 22 together. Now, as, as we read, now I want, you to, I want to encourage you in the way you read Scripture. Okay? I put in the simple guide to personal worship, encouragement to read the Bible slowly, carefully, prayerfully, thoughtfully, humbly, and joyfully. Okay? So, so read the Word slowly. The goal is not to See how fast you can get it done. Read it thoughtfully. This is not mindless activity. We want to see, we want to imagine, we want to understand what's going on in the text. And this, this text work. Mark it down. The Bible will not yield its fruit to the lazy. And there's, there's thoughtful diligence that needs to get in engaging our mind in the word. And, and learning to understand the Bible, it's not something that just happens overnight. It continually grows. The more we read, the more we study the Bible, the more we'll grow in it. And, and we, we miss this. Someone will become a Christian, we'll hand them a Bible and say, go for it. And 30 years later, they still don't know how to study the Bible. This is tragic. And I don't want that to be the case for you, for any one of us in this room. I want to help us to understand how to read it thoughtfully, carefully. So Bible study is a journey. We have to be careful where we step because there's a lot of difficult issues that we encounter along the way. We've already come across some difficult texts and reading, especially through Genesis, and they'll just get more difficult. Like, what do you do when you get to Leviticus 19.19 and it says you should not wear a garment made of two types of material? And is that like, all right, I'm getting rid of everything that's not 100% cotton. Like, is that, is that the step you're going to take? We, we read a couple weeks ago, Peter walking on water in Matthew chapter 14. Does this mean you need to go out to a lake or a pool somewhere and just try it, see if you really have faith? I've, I've mentioned before the story, I won't tell the, the, all the details, but of when I was reading, trying out for the eighth grade basketball team, so I remember this story, and... Uh, Wanting to try to think of how can I impress the coach? I was the shortest kid in the eighth grade, four foot nothing runt. I'm like, how can I impress the coach and convince him to put me on the team? And so I'm reading the Bible one day and I come to Luke 137, which says, Nothing is impossible with God. And I, I just conclude, okay, well, that's my answer. If nothing is impossible with God, then that means I could dunk the basketball. And if I could dunk the basketball, the coach would have to put me on the team. So I remember. It, Unfortunately, totally true story. I left my Bible sitting there. I went outside my house. I got a basketball. I went to the back of the driveway. And I said, Lord, I believe with your power I can dunk this basketball. You said it in your word. And so I believe I can do this. And I planned out how many steps it was going to take for me to get from the, I wanted everything to be perfect. How many steps it was going to take to get from the back of the driveway up to the goal. My plan was when I was two feet away, I was going to close my eyes. So follow with me here. I'm going to close my eyes, take the last two steps with my eyes closed, and jump with my eyes closed. That way I can picture angels lifting me up to the goal. And, uh, 
And my, my plan is, when I get up the goal, I'm going to obviously throw the ball to the rim, and then I'm going to hang there for a while, because I've never, never been up there before. And so I had it all planned out. I go back. Totally true story. And I, I wish there was exaggeration in this story. There's not. No exaggeration. I got down on my knees, and I start praying, Lord, you said in your word, nothing's impossible with you. I and mean, people driving by, normal day for them, I'm having a revival right here in the driveway. I get up off my knees in prayer, and I, and I start running. Got the ball in my hand, got every step planned out. I get two feet away. I close my eyes, take the last two steps of my eyes closed. I mean, I could, as I jumped, I could picture, I could feel angels on left and right. And the next thing I, I felt was that basketball pole right in my forehead. I mean, just, I mean just, just imagine walking by my house on that day. Like you see a kid get up off his knees, supposedly in prayer, and just go running and jump into a basketball pole. So... Go to Luke 137, you'll see this has nothing to do with making the eighth grade basketball team when it says nothing is impossible with God. This is like the virgin birth of the Son of God. So that's very different. So we need to be careful that we don't just read the Bible and think, oh, okay, well, that means this. So, okay, so we need to read the Bible thoughtfully, carefully. We need to read the Bible prayerfully. Ah, oh, this one I remind you, remind you, you never study the Bible alone. Never. You say, wait a minute, I thought we were supposed to go in our room, close the door, pray to our fathers unseen. Exactly. God has given us not only the gift of his word, but the gift of his spirit. Christian, you have the spirit of God in you, with you, whenever you open this word, to open your eyes to understand it. This is communion with God as you're reading his word. Bible study is a supernatural activity. A divine encounter with the Word of God through the Spirit of God. This is an awesome thought. Which leads us to read this text humbly. So we're not, we're not coming, we're not reading this book like we read any other book in the world. This book has authority in our lives. We're not coming to this book. It's like some self-help book where we're looking for options to consider in our lives. We are not looking for options to consider in this world. We're looking for commands to obey. And in that sense, every day when we open up this word, it's like we're putting the blank check on the table again with our lives in a fresh way, saying, whatever you say, I'll do. Whatever you leave me to do. And we do this because we trust God. We trust that God knows what is best for us. And that leads to the joy that's found in the word. Because we know that what God has for us is better than what we would have for ourselves. And we know there's greater joy to be found in him and relationship with him than in anyone or anything else this world has to offer us. And this is, this is the danger of never learning to study the Bible on our own, which so many Christians tragically never learn to do. And as a result, their entire spiritual life is lived by proxy through somebody else. Maybe a Christian comes every single Sunday to hear the word preached by someone else, which is obviously not bad in and of itself. Scripture's clear. There's a place for that. But you, you never fall in love with someone by proxy. You don't fall in love with your spouse through another person. You don't love your spouse through someone else, by proxy. You fall in love with someone directly, personally, in intimacy with that person. And I am zealous for you not just to know God through sermons here on Sunday. I'm zealous for you to read this book like every day. That's why we're reading through the Bible together because I'm convinced that when you do, you will fall in love with the author of this book. And you will find true life under the authority of this book. I'm convinced of it. Which is why I'm praying. No spectators in here. When it comes to the members of this church especially, okay, we're reading through the Bible. Not just, okay, I think we're talking about that, but I'm not really doing it. Let's do this. And let's know God. Commune with God. See what God does. So, all right, Genesis chapter 22, in light of that, let's, let's read it. Slowly, carefully, 
thoughtfully, humbly, joyfully, and, and prayerfully. Let's, let, me, let me pray. Dear God, oh God, we realize you are Lord over the universe, the creator of everything and the sustainer of everything. We know that our hearts are beating in this room right now only because you are giving them rhythm. And you're doing it for seven billion people at the same time. You're king over all creation. The God who spoke a word and the world came into being. And yet, even in light of your grandeur, you are with us now. We are awed by that, oh God. We're awed by the fact that your presence is with us in this room. That you've given us your word and that you are about to speak to us individually through it. And so we say yes. Yes, yes, yes. Speak to us. Speak to us, oh God. We don't, we don't treat this casually or tritely. We, we want to hear from you, God. And we want your word and its powerful effects to, to take place in our minds, in our hearts, in our lives. in ways that have eternal ramifications as a result of the next few moments in this room. I pray for, pray for non-Christians who are here that as we read your word, I pray that your spirit would open the eyes of hearts to see your love and that people today would trust in you for the first time And for your sons and daughters all across this room, have the Spirit of God in us, your Spirit in us, we pray that you would illumine our minds right now to understand what you have said and, and consequently what you are saying to us. I want to hear from you. In Jesus' name we pray these things with great anticipation. Amen. Genesis 22. And so that's where I encourage you to start. That's where I start my time in the Word in the morning. It's just, even just a short prayer. Lord, I want to hear from you. So Lord, we want to hear from you. Genesis 22, verse 1. After these things, God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. And he cut the wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place from afar. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. I and the boy will go over there and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. And he took in his hand the fire and the knife. So they went, both of them together. And Isaac said to his father Abraham, My father. And he said, Here I am, my son. 
He said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went, both of them together. When they came to the place of which God had told him, Abraham built the altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing you've not withheld your son, your only son from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. And the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. And I will surely multiply your offspring as the stars of heaven and as the sand that is on the seashore. And your offspring shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in your offspring shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they arose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham lived at Beersheba. Now after these things it was told to Abraham, Behold, Milcah has also borne children to your brother Nahor. Uz his firstborn, Buz his brother, Kemuel the father of Aram, Kesed, Hazo, Pildash, Jidlap, and Bethuel. Bethuel fathered Rebekah. These eight Milcah bore to Nahor, Abraham's brother, Moreover, his concubine, whose name was Ruma, bore Teba, Gaham, Tahash, and Makkah. Just as a side note, when you're in a small group and it's your turn to like read the Bible and you get to these weird names, the key is just read them like you know how they should be pronounced, like, like you know what you're doing. So you just go fast. Nobody else knows if you're wrong. So just say it, say it in... Yeah, just, that's just a little encouragement. Don't, don't, oh, what, how do you say that? Just act like you know how to say it. Act like you're Hebrew. Oh, yeah, Jidlop. That, it's like a household name. Okay, so, all right, back to the text. All right, read, read, that's first step. And quick side note here, we're not gonna spend time here uh, right now, like we've done in the past, passages like 1 Corinthians 13, and we'll do them in the future, but memorize. So I wanna encourage you, during reading during the week, so you got a couple chapters a day, to look for maybe a verse a week to memorize. This is one of the, my goals and, and my personal style making plan is to, is to memorize one verse a week out of the chapters that we're, we're reading uh, to at least start there. And so I want to encourage you to do that. As you come across a verse, look for verses that really stick out and say, I'm going to memorize that. Maybe short, maybe long, maybe a couple of verses. You'll see we, on the front of the worship guide every week is a Proposed memory verse, so from this last week, Genesis 2, 17 and 18 is on there. So if that would help, then, then feel free to use that. Or, or if there's something that sticks out particularly to you, let me encourage you to memorize and, and to build that into your Bible reading. Your word have I hidden in my heart, so hide it, lodge it there in a way that just reading doesn't do. Memorizing lodges it deeper. And you might think, well, I just... I, I just don't have the ability to memorize. I can't memorize. Uh, I hear that all the time. And I know different people have different abilities to memorize. So there's no question about that. But we, we've mentioned before, uh, if, I were, if I were to tell you today, I'll give you $1,000 for every verse you can memorize. You, you'd learn, like today, to memorize. If you get $1,000 for every single verse. And so this word is, is, is better than gold. And much fine gold, Psalm 19 says. So, so store it away in your heart. So spend time. Have some kind of intentionality in memorizing and having other people help you. So I'll spend time memorizing, and then I've got other people that I'll, I'll share. Okay, here's what I've memorized, and help me to remember this, and that sort of thing. So let me encourage you to make it a priority to, to memorize. So read, examine. 
examine the text. We want to understand what is Genesis 22 saying. I mentioned we need to read the Bible carefully. And so this is where I want to give you some cautions. Because this is where even well-meaning believers can go awry in Bible study really quickly. So if we're not careful, we can approach the Bible in unhealthy ways, asking unhelpful questions. So for example, we can take a pretty superficial approach to the Bible, read a text like Genesis 22, and then ask, okay, what does this chapter mean to me? Probably the most common mistake in studying the Bible is to read and then ask, okay, what does this mean to me? This happens all the time in small group Bible studies. You got people sitting around a room, they'll read a verse or passage, somebody say, okay, what does this mean to you? And all of a sudden, people start saying all kinds of different things that this passage means to them. And Bob over here will say, well, I think this chapter means I need to go hiking with my son more. Just like Abraham went hiking into the mountains with Isaac. Well, okay, Bob. Uh, anybody else got something this passage means? And Joe over here says, well, I think it's clear from this passage that it's okay to sacrifice animals, which means no one should be a vegetarian. To which Joe's wife Mary, a vegetarian, replies, well, that's not what this passage means to me. Maybe this passage means I need to sacrifice you, Joe. And, <laughs> and so, so when we start a Bible study with the question, what does this passage mean to me, the conversation quickly congeals into a pool of ignorance where a group of people find themselves sitting around sharing what they don't know about the Bible. And the same thing can happen in our personal Bible studies. So this is where I want to remind you that the first question we ask is not, what does this passage mean to me? Instead, we're after, what, is, what does the Holy Spirit mean in this passage, period? Quite frankly, I don't care what the passage means to you. I don't care what the passage means to me. I, want, I care what, what the passage means according to the Holy Spirit's inspiration of it. You say, well, don't you know, David, that the Bible means different things to different people? No, that's application which we'll get to in a minute. There's no question that the Bible applies to our lives in different ways, but this is not open to us to attach all kinds of different meanings to it. God has given us this word and it has meaning in it, and our goal in Bible study is to understand the meaning of a verse, what the Holy Spirit meant when he gave us Genesis 22. So this means we're not looking for what feels right to us. We're not gonna twist the Bible to make it fit our tastes. In the process, ignore God's truth. This means we're not looking for what works best for our lives so we can take Scripture and accommodate it to our lives. It's a self-centered, arrogant way to study the Bible that misses the whole point. We're not, we're not taking some super spiritual approach where we're looking for hidden meaning in every chapter that nobody else has ever discovered before. People have been studying this book for a couple of thousand years. There's nothing new that's coming to the table. Our goal in Bible study is to, to find out what the Holy Spirit has said for thousands of years in a passage of Scripture because that's the same thing he's saying to us now, which means we need to examine the text. It's like we're detectives. We're, we're trying to discover as much as possible in the text, which means we're going to look and we're going to observe. We're going to write down what we see. We're going to look at details. We're going to ask questions. Who, what, when, where, why? Who wrote this book? Who, who's reading this chapter originally? Who are the main characters here? Where is all this taking place? When is all this taking place? What's the sequen, sequence of events? What's happening in the text? What's wrong in the picture? What's the author communicating? Why is the author communicating that? Why is he communicating it this way or that way? And so you'll see here, and you know, it's a summary of those kind of questions. What's happening in the passage? What words, phrases, or ideas seem particularly important? So what we're looking at, we want to see the details of the passage. And most of the time, we read the Bible so quickly, we skip over this altogether. And so this is not, we're not driving through a fast food restaurant here. We're sitting down for a meal. And so we need to have patience with the text and ponder over it to look at words and phrases and verses and think about them, spend time thinking about them. And I think about when, when Heather and I, to go back to uh, us getting to know each other, and she'd write me a letter before we got married, and I would just take every word in that letter and dissect it. Like, what, is, what does she mean by this? Like, she said she likes me. Like, likes me as friend or likes me as more than a friend. She said she's praying for me. Well, what is that like? She's praying for me like she prays for anybody or like she's praying for her future husband. She's praying for me. She put a smiley face at the end. Does she always do that? Is that something like special for me? And so this is what we're doing in Bible study. We're looking at every little detail. 
and, and saying, okay, what is, what is, we want to get in the shoes of the writer, the reader, the people in the text. We want to see the sights. We want to smell the smells. We want to experience the emotions. So we want to make observations. That's what that first question is after, making observations. And then once we've made observations of what the Bible is saying, then that can lead us to interpretation of what the Bible means. Which is when we step back and we consider what truth here is God communicating about himself and about us, not just to this people at this time, but to all people of all time. And so in your notes there, this is where you've got, and this is in the simple guide to personal worship, the question, what does this text teach you about the gospel? Which is, I think, a helpful way, I hope a helpful way, to help you think about timeless truth that is in the text. So think about the threads of the gospel. What does this text teach us about God? What does this text teach us about man? What does this text teach us about who Jesus is and why we need him? You say, well, this is an Old Testament text. I don't see Jesus mentioned anywhere here. But remember, Jesus is the hero at the center of this entire book. Luke chapter 24, he's walking on that road to Emmaus with, with those men. And he says, and the Bible says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. All the scriptures centers around Christ. So we ask in any text, what does this text help us know about Jesus and who he is and why we need him? The necessity of faith, what does this text teach us about trusting and following Jesus and then the urgency of eternity? Does this text teach us anything about the hope of heaven or the horror of hell? Now, it's not that every single text answers every single one of those questions specifically, but I would argue most texts address most, if not all, of those questions. But these are questions that are intended to get us thinking in our Bible study Okay, I've observed what the text is saying, what it said to those people at that time. Now, what does this text mean? Not just to me, not just to this person or that person. What does this text mean to all people of all time? So, here's what I want us to do. Audience participation time. No spectators here. I want you to take the next few minutes, maybe five minutes, and answer these questions under examine. So you've got some space in your notes, and you can do this you can do this alone, just like you would on a, on a on tomorrow morning. You're sitting alone with the Word, and you've got some questions to think through. So you can do this alone, or if you'd like, you can do this with a couple people around you or somebody around you. That's fine, too. So for the next five minutes, unpack these questions. Start with observation. Just write down, okay, what's happening in this passage? Well, words, phrases, ideas seem particularly important. So observing, you're looking for details. What, what's sticking out here when it comes to details in the passage? And then, based on that, so that's why there's an order here. That's why then, okay, we step back and we begin to ask, okay, what does this mean? What does this, what does this text teach us about God, man, who Jesus is, why we need him, trusting him, following him? And anything there about the hope of heaven or the horror of hell? So, it's five minutes. I want to encourage you to spend time just writing down some observations and interpretation, answering those questions there. And then we'll, we'll move on from there. So, go. All right, let's bring this back together. I know that's a short amount of time, but that's maybe even that an illustration of, okay, there's so much. If we'll take the time, there's so much to be unearthed, to be discovered, realized here. Let's, let's think about these this questions together, and this will be brief. It will not do justice to this text, but, but what's happening in this passage, what words, phrases, ideas seem particularly important. And remember, and this is one of the values of reading through the Bible. So we realize this is 22 to just come on the pages of Scripture in isolation. There's, there's lead up. I mean, even the first, first few words, after these things, God tested Abraham. So what are these things? Well, certainly there's, there's story right before this. So we think about what's led to this point. We think about Sarah, a 90-year-old woman who had in 90 years not born one son to Abraham. And the agony over that. And God's promises over and over and over again to Abraham and Sarah, they would have a son together. But nothing had happened. He's 100 years old by then. They get this promise that the next year they're going to have a baby. They're going to have a son. And Sarah laughs. You can't blame her. I mean, she's 90. He's 100. And yet God, in miraculous mercy, provides a son Isaac, the child of promise, whom God had promised to them. 
Now, after these things, you realize that, the buildup leading up to that, and then you get to verse 2, and God says, Take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. What is that about? Did God really just tell Abraham to slay the son of promise? And the emphasis there is almost agonizing. Your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love. And when we hear sermons on Genesis 22, we immediately jump to Abraham's faith, which is obviously a, a, a part of this passage, a significant part of this passage. But this isn't just about a father. This is about a son, isn't it? Maybe even primarily about a son. Did you see it? Did you see how many times the son was mentioned over and over and over and over again? And maybe circle it every time you see the word son here in Genesis 22. Start in verse 2 there. He said, take your son, so circle it there, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah. Verse 3, so Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and not just Isaac, and his son, Isaac. Well, we know it's a son, but he says it. Verse 6, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, Verse 7, Isaac said to his father Abraham, my father, and he said, here I am. Not just here I am, period, like he had said earlier and says later, here I am, my son. Get down to verse 8. Abraham said, God will provide for himself a lamb for a burnt offering, my son. So they went both of them together. Verse 9, when they came to the place of which God had told him. This is where the climax of the story is building to. Things just slow down here. Abraham built the altar there, laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to slaughter his son. And get down to verse 12. And God speaks to this angel. Don't lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, seeing that you've not withheld your son, your only son from me. You get down to verse 16. God says, by myself I've sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will surely bless you. You see it? Eleven different circles you should have there in your Bible. Eleven times in 16 verses, really 15 in a row there, that son is mentioned. Three of those times it stretches your only son. So this is, this is clearly a, a picture of a son Son of promise, potentially being slain. But then, there's a repetition of another phrase. So your son, your only son, three times. There's another repetition of a phrase three times. Did you notice it? Verse 8. God will provide for himself the lamb for a burnt offering. Then down in verse 14, twice. Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide. As it said to this day, on the mountain of the Lord, it shall be provided. The Lord will provide. And then based on God's provision of a sacrifice, God's promises to Abraham just start to flow. Okay, so this is what's happening in the text. Now we're starting to realize it's not about taking your son hiking or whether or not to be vegetarian. Like this is, this is much more important. And some of the things we would have mean. So we're observing these things, then we step back and we ask the question, okay, what does this text teach us about the gospel? So what does this text teach us about God? And immediately, we've, we've seen it, now we feel the tension of the text. Why would a loving God command the slaying of an only son? And the answer is clear, to show that he provides. God commands the slaying of a son, Isaac, who is, by the way, the seed of the people of Israel. Who would be reading this in order to show Isaac and the people of Israel that he provides for their salvation. Isaac is saved. He doesn't die. Why? Because God provides a ram in the thicket. Don't miss the language of verse 13. To be sacrificed as a burnt offering instead of Isaac. Literally in the place of Isaac. God takes a substitute and puts him on the altar in order to save Isaac from death so that Isaac can live. God commands the slaying of a son to show his faithfulness to save his people. God provides. He's faithful to his promise. 
What does this text teach us about man? Well, certainly man is in need of God's provision. Where would Abraham's, Abraham and Isaac be without God's provision, without God's promises? Beyond this, you, 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 you put yourself in the shoes of this, this precious son asking, Dad, we got the fire and we got the wood, but where's the lamb? Where's the sacrifice? And from all we know, Abraham doesn't know how all this is going to unfold, but he knows that God will provide. Doesn't that shed light on us? There's all kinds of circumstances, situations we find ourselves. We see here the limited perspective of man. God knows how all of this is going to work out. We don't always know how all of this is going to work out. But back to the main point. Man here, clearly pictured in this text, in need of the mercy of God, of the provision of God, which obviously leads to the sufficiency of Christ, what this text teaches us about who Jesus is and why we need him. Now, I want to be clear here. I've obviously chosen a passage that presents a pretty clear connection to Christ. And I'm not saying it's always this easy, this clear. In the days to come, maybe you'll take one of the, just some random obscure passage of Scripture and we'll do this together and, and hopefully see some of these truths even there. But don't miss the picture here. God commanding the slaying of a son, an only son, to show that he provides for their salvation. After this point in Scripture, you never, ever see God again asking for the sacrifice of a son. Until you get to a well-known verse like John 3.16, and it says that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. And this is where you and I enter into the picture and we realize it's not just ultimately about Isaac being on an altar, it's about you and I being under the knife of God's wrath do every single one of us in this room in our sin. deserving of death, you, me, and God in his mercy provides a substitute to take our place on that altar. And this substitute is not a ram in a thicket. This substitute is his one and only son. Non-Christian, here today, we invite you to see the love of God for you. That though you, just like every one of us in this room, you have sinned against God, you've turned away from God's ways to your own way, and you deserve judgment from God, God has made a way for you to come out from under his judgment. He has sent his son, his only son, to pay the price for our sin as a sacrifice for our sin. He has died in our place so that we could come out from under the knife of God's holy wrath and live forever. You say, how can I receive that salvation? Leads to the next question. What does this text teach us about trusting and following Jesus? And the answer all over Genesis 22 is faith by faith. It's what we've read about leading up to this in Genesis. We remember Genesis 15, 6, Abraham believed God and God counted it to him as righteousness because he believed God. From the very beginning, he sets out with his son, believing God. Believing God every step of this journey. This is it. So non-Christian, this, this is not the Bible saying, okay, so you've sinned against God, so here's a list of things you need to do, things you need to make right in order to, to get to God. This is the Bible saying, believe in God's love for you. This is the Bible saying, trust in God's provision for you on your behalf. And do not be mistaken, non-Christian, Christian alike, do not be mistaken. This is not just faith that's some mere intellectual adherence. Okay, I'll, yeah, I'll kind of believe that in my head. This is, this is faith that transforms head, heart, life. This is faith that leads to radical obedience. This is faith that leads Abraham to do what he's doing in this passage because he trusts God. He's doing what may not make sense at all to him or the world around him, but he trusts God. God and it leads, inevitably leads to obedient action. 
trusting, following. You, you, you see all over this text, don't you, just a quiet submissiveness? Abraham before God, even Isaac before Abraham. We don't, we don't, we don't get all the emotions. Everybody. You've, got a, you've got a son who's quietly saying, where's the lamb? Abraham responds. And then you've got a son being put on the altar. And we don't know exactly what that scene must have been like as Abraham's tying up his son on an altar of sacrifice. You can only imagine. But the text gives us this picture, don't miss it, of Abraham taking wood that will fuel the fire of sacrifice and putting it on Isaac's back to carry it. And we can't help but to think about God in fast forwarding to Jesus, as Jesus goes to the cross, he is carrying it on his own back. As he says to his followers around him, if you're going to follow me, you must deny yourself, take up your cross. This picture of submissiveness is all over this text. To trust, to follow Jesus means to put the blank check on the table. To say, my life is yours, my family is yours, my future is yours. And what does all that teach us about the hope of heaven and the horror of hell? Obviously, heaven's not mentioned, hell's not mentioned here. But when I'm studying Scripture, I'm asking the question here, does this passage shed any light on what it means to have an, an eternal perspective of life on this earth? And I think about this text and the promise that God gave Abraham in the end, a promise that will far outlive Abraham's time on earth. And I realize when you trust in God, you are trusting in a God whose promises never fail. And by never, I mean never. Never fail. You're a part of an eternal plan that is marked by everlasting promises. And that changes your perspective of life today. So, examine. I'm not saying that you wrote down the exact same things that I may have written down there. Maybe some of those things you had, maybe some of those things you didn't. Maybe you had other things that I didn't even mention here. There's treasures to be found. Again, there's a few brief comments and a glorious passage of Scripture. But on a whole, I hope it comes clear. Like this, this is what the text means. God provides for the salvation of His people through the slaying sacrifice of a uh, of, a, of a son eventually to come in Christ, to a lamb here, a ram in the thicket, and then a uh, lamb without blemish or de defect, his only son to come in the future. So how does the meaning of that text then transform my life today? And we begin to ask questions like these that are in your notes. What, what sins then do I need to repent of or avoid? What truths do I need to believe? What commands do I need to obey in my life? What do I need to give up, stop doing, start doing, continue doing? What Principles need to change the way I think, speak, act. How will I implement that change? What relationships do I need to establish, strengthen, or change? So we don't want to just hear the word and so deceive ourselves. Brooke Hills, the goal is not more Bible information as a result of reading the Bible. The goal is total transformation of our hearts and our minds and our lives. So we've got to ask the question, by the power of God's Spirit, what can I do today to apply God's Word to my life? Now, I want, you to, I want to help you think through those questions, but let me, let me give you an opportunity first, though. We'll do one more audience participation time. Let me invite you to take just a couple minutes right now and do this on your own, so don't do this with somebody else. But think through those questions in light of this text and write out any responses. So it doesn't have to be, okay, i got to fill out answers to all these questions, but but think through, is there any sin here in reading this text that the Lord's uncovering in my own life that I need to repent of or avoid? Any truth, truths I need to believe? Maybe, maybe something I've, I've already believed, but the Lord's just more firmly planting my feet in that foundation. Commands that I need to obey. Principles I need to change the way I think, speak, act. I'm going to implement that change. Relationships I need to establish, strength and change. So what can I do on this Sunday, today, to apply God's word, this word, to my life. So spend a few minutes on that, and then, then I'll bring it back together to close this out. Feel free to keep writing. Um, again, just insufficient time, I know, but one of, the, one of the things I love, even about preaching, so every Sunday, 
I'm preaching the word, saying this is what the word means. And the spirit of God takes that meaning, takes that word, and just applies it to different situations and different circumstances all around the room in wonderfully creative and powerful ways. And so when I think about us as a church reading through the Bible every single day, and we're, we're all reading the same text, but the way those texts and application from the Spirit of God are just landing at different places in our lives, it's just glorious to think about. I mean, these, these questions, in this chapter, like, what, what sins do I need to repent of and to avoid? You spend time meditating here, really thinking, pondering here? I know in my own life, just numerous ways that I, I'm evidencing a lack of trust in God that I need to repent of. Just our unbelief. Truths that I need to believe about God as provider. Think about truths about the promises of God that he's given to us. And we need to trust in this circumstance and that circumstance. Amidst confusion, amidst heartache, amidst questions that we have. Trust God's promises. What commands do we need to obey? I, I put myself in Abraham's shoes. God commands me to take my son and sacrifice him. When, when I obey, I immediately think about Things in my life, God is telling me to do, stop doing. Okay, I need to obey in these areas. I, I, I was looking this morning on the front of the worship guide. Uh, J.D. Payne, our pastor of Church Multiplication, wrote this uh, excerpt on what he's looking forward to in 2014. And he shares some of the follow-up. Remember a few months ago when we had that, uh, um, that day where we, where we dove into Romans and we we encourage one to think about who is the Lord raising up from among us to go midterm, either to North America to engage unreached people groups or among the nations outside of North America to engage unreached people groups. And certain people stood up. So how is the follow-through coming from that? Those of you who stood up or maybe, maybe is the Lord now calling some of you? I mean, I, I read this and I'm uh, 20 brothers and sisters right now from our faith family considering leaving Birmingham in the next 12 to 18 months, next year, year and a half. Church planning teams are developing and praying about moving to other cities to make disciples among Indian Hindus in Metro New York. So there are families that are praying right now, Lord, we believe you're leading us to move to New York to work among Indian Hindus. Others that are doing the same with Arab Muslims in Detroit, Afghans in Metro San Francisco, Iranians in Toronto, Somalis in Seattle. So this is happening all across this room. And, and there's information there. If you want to be a part of that last paragraph, if you want to be a part of one of those teams, talk with them about their future plans in these cities or discuss the possibility of developing a team to reach a different people group. Contact Church Multiplication, this number and this email address. Oh, we're reading this text about God calling Abraham to do something that he never could have imagined doing. And in the end, seeing that God's doing this ultimately for his blessing to go to the nations. So I'm reading this this morning. I'm thinking, Lord... Lord, call out some people today to join these teams. So just put the blank check on the table. Is the Lord leading any of you to join these teams? Find out more information about them. I'm going to call you to obey if he, if he is, if that's even a possibility. What principles need to change the way I think, speak, and or act, how I'll implement that change. You think about this principle from the text. When God calls us to a step of obedience, he will be faithful to provide for us as we go. So we start, we start thinking, all right, what God called me to do that I need to do? Ah, this is going to be really hard. It comes right in principle from the text. You can trust God. If you can trust him, to provide for your eternal salvation, you can trust him to provide for your everyday needs. What relationship do I need to establish, strengthen, change? But by the power of God's spirit, what can I do today to apply God's word to my life? And let me just add something here. And this is in that simple guide to personal worship. But when you've studied the word, I want to encourage you to make part of your application sharing what you've studied with somebody else. So maybe it's your roommate, maybe it's your spouse, maybe it's a child or your children. Maybe it's a coworker, maybe it's a friend, maybe it's your small group. But, but when you, you finish studying the word, stop and ask. I, I say to the Lord, I know this was not intended just for me. It's not intended to stop with me. Your word's intended to spread through me. So who do, who, who do you want me to share this with? How can I share this with somebody? And that'll do, that'll do a lot, both for accountability to what, what the Lord is telling you to do, encouraging others in their faith, becoming a word-saturated 
community people. So let me encourage you to, to make, that, make that a question you ask. Who do I share this with? And then, and then do it. Don't keep this word to yourself. All that leads us to, to pray. And this is what we spent time talking about specifically a few weeks ago. To let the text, let the word prompt you to praise and worship God as provider and to repent of ways that you need to turn from your sin and yourself and trust in him. To ask, to intercede. And we talked about spontaneous things. So there may be things in the text that, that this, this provokes you to pray for your life, for others' lives, for people in your life, for things going on in the world. And then to have intentional time where you're praying specifically for different things in your life and other people's lives and all that leading you to yield. I mean, you read Genesis 22 and you come away with this this phrase resounding, another one of those phrases that's repeated, here I am, here I am, here I am. Lord, here I am. My life's, my life's yours. So use me for your glory. Help me to trust in you. So we yield our lives to him.